holiday tips and fun facts from Paul, Kristen, and Dexter at Total Wine and More. Looking for wine with a reindeer inspired name for your secret Santa? You've come to the right place. The sweetness of a maple glazed ham paired with a bourbon barrel aged Cabernet. Uh oh. We went there. And now my taste buds are hopping. I can help you impress the boss with a great bottle of wine. Here's to a raise in 2019. As you check off that gift list this holiday season, we'd love to share our always low prices and ridiculous selection at Total Wine and More. Cheers. Welcome, welcome. It is a uh, live streaming edition of Raised by Wolves uh, here at 1500 ESPN. And uh, we are streaming live on Facebook, I think YouTube, Periscope, just about anywhere that you can find a live stream. Yeah, Twitter, everything. And uh, Manny Hill, Dane Moore. Danny Cunningham, we're all here relaxing on some comfortable couches, and uh, we're going to talk some Wolves basketball as we do um, every edition of this podcast. And um, Portland loss, I, I look back at that, and I just kind of feel like, and Danny, you and I, we talked about it over the weekend, mm-hmm. you just have that feeling like if Robert Covington was in that game, the Wolves would have found a way to win that game. Yeah, and that game felt the entire time like they had no business being in it, but there they were, and they took a lead in the fourth quarter, and it, it just felt like you knew Damian Lillard was going to do something at the end, which he obviously did for Portland. That's why they won the game. He but always does. It, it felt team. like the Wolves just <laughs> didn't have enough, no matter how close they were or if they were winning even at the end. It, it just felt like they were going to find a way to not win that game, and, and Portland found a way to win it. But to your point, if Covington plays there, that's a game they probably win. So that loss definitely stings more for the franchise than last night's to Golden State did. Well, they, they messed up the defensive coverage at the end of the game against Damian yeah. Lillard. Mm-hmm. Um, and Carl and the Towns other one didn't was a raise good up. Shot. And, and the other one's just a tough shot that he I had. mean, both of them. I mean, Cat needs to be they're, – they're playing up on those. They've been playing them the whole time. Nurkic kind of sprinted into the screen, and it allowed more space for Lillard to be open to make those, to make those shots. And what we haven't seen much of with Robert Covington in the game is defensive breakdowns, even – it's weird. There's just kind of been a, I don't know what, what even the word is, just a an aura effect where mm. everyone else seems to just do their job better. Like it doesn't even make sense. But it's weird to think that even if Covington was in that in the game in that play off the ball, that it would have the play would have been different. Maybe he would have like been in Cat's ear a little bit more to get up there. But it's it's just the defense was so different, particularly against the pick and roll with uh, Covington out versus when he has been in. For How much of it is him having an effect that way or him being able to erase mistakes? I think both. I mean, that one may be more specifically. Like, okay, so if he was in the game there and he's at the point of attack guarding Dame, maybe he's able to get up over the screen a little bit sure. better than, I don't was it was it Teague? I believe so. Oh, it was Jeff, yeah. Yeah, yeah on, on Lillard there. So, yeah, there's some of that, but I, I do think it's both. It would probably just, you know, We've talked. I think we talked about this last week. It's the KG effect of like, okay, things are kind of spiraling out of control, and he's there to just stop it mm-hmm. and kind of stop allow, the yeah, allow the team to recalibrate. So, so yeah, I mean, that's what we've seen out of Covington all year. Then that obviously was just not really there against Portland, and I don't think it was there in Golden State or against Golden State last night either. The that game to me um, looked a lot like the previous time they played Golden State earlier, and I don't know if that means Covington isn't totally healthy. Golden State's awesome, or what exactly it is, mm-hmm. but it uh, it wasn't that kind of Covington-led Wolves team that we've seen for kind of the first eleven games. I think it was that he played. So, yeah, is he a legit defensive player of the year candidate? The way this defense has transformed overall since he since he got here. I mean, it it is only December eleventh, so I think that we have to temper this kind of talk for all awards, whether it's Derrick Rose with the Sixth Man of the Year award right. or whomever you want to name as your MVP leader right now. I think we have to pump the brakes a little bit for every award, but yeah, I, I mean, he's transformed this team. He's a guy that has a reputation, which for this award you absolutely need. For Sixth Man of the Year, you don't necessarily need it, and for MVP, you don't necessarily need it. But Defensive Player of the Year, so much of it is based on reputation because we don't necessarily have a great metric to tell you how good someone is as a defender. You can't just because you can't just look at, well, he led the league in block shots. So or he plus minus. Defensive player just, of the, yeah. You have to dig deeper to be able to judge who's really a great defender because it's we don't have a, a true metric to just be like, this guy is the best. There's not one of those for defensive statistics right now. 
But I, I think that you have to – he is one of the best defenders in the league, and he's absolutely changed the way the Wolves have been able to play defense. I think probably the if you're trying to look for a number or like a way to you know cut out some players not to be eligible for it, it would be guys on – not top 10 defenses. I think you at least need to be a top, a top 10 team defense. Sure. Probably top five. For me, my assumption is the Wolves, even though they have been that since the trade, I'm not banking on a top five level. Probably, I wouldn't say they'll finish top 10 level either for the rest of the way. So that might preclude him, but he's definitely, I would think, would be, will be in the conversation, maybe sure. a finalist, the top five or whatever. I, I've been incredibly impressed with him. Totally. Since, yeah. since he was acquired, I have been blown away with how, how well he's played on that end of the floor. And he I mean, he makes highlight plays defensively. It's not just he locks down a guy and you don't, he gets isolated or whatever and you don't hear from him. He's made some incredible plays. It just, yeah, I, I've said this, this numerous times and written it. It's um, I, I felt pretty familiar with Robert Covington, Covington coming into the trade. And I wasn't. It's uh, mm-hmm. once you're watching him every single night, and you're and you're seeing those those highlight plays, and but maybe even more so the the stop the bleeding type things. Yeah, it the the consistency of that steeping in that defensive excellence really has made him stick out in a way to me that I wasn't I wasn't expecting when the trade happened. And I think he's helped in the locker room too a lot more than huge. A lot more than the the public or just the regular fan realizes, I think that he's been a big boost inside of that room. It would be, I mean, we see the little, like, post-locker room. Because we're there every that. night where the, the, the listener to this or someone watching the game on Fox Sports North, they don't have that same access. So they don't necessarily realize, one, how much that matters, because I think it matters in basketball more than any other sport. Mm -hmm. In baseball, you've got a 25-man clubhouse, and it's a really individualized sport. In football, if you play defense and you hate someone on offense, it it doesn't matter at at the end of the day. I'm just kind of, I'm skeptical a little bit of it. Like, I think there's an act element to it. I'm not saying that, like, Cat and Covington aren't cool and, like, boys to some degree, but... There's there's a bit of an act to the oh like I'm gonna come and interview you while you're in the media scrum like when you know there's cameras but there when you know the I, media, I'm not even talking some about that. that I'm talking about like them making dinner plans after games and, yeah. and always being the last two guys in the locker room I'm not talking about like after shoot around when they ask each other media questions like that's all good and fun but yeah. I get that that could be an act but I'm talking like them making plans to hang out yeah. and, and doing those types of things that I don't know that necessarily existed prior to this. And I, and I also think, too, it, it'll be interesting to see, especially now that they're on this West Coast road trip and they've lost two in a row now. So if the losses start to pile up, you start to wonder, okay, is this great chemistry that we've been seeing the first few weeks since the trade, you know, what's going to happen? What's going to happen when they face some – some sort of extended adversity is that chemistry still going to be you well, know I would ha- I would have to think if someone on this roster knows how to handle losing it's Robert Covington I mean the guy sure. was part yeah. the guy was part of a team that went 10 and 72 <laughs> like if someone knows how to deal with losses it has to be him right yeah no I yeah. Mean, think so um I mean I think any team faces that question even um you know even teams who have who have had good runs in the past and they've been friendly together they've been a strong group like Losing can just have a, a really adverse effect on those personalities. And every dynamics. team goes through it. No, Look at Golden no, State. Yeah, no, right. With the no whole team, Draymond and KD yes. thing. Yeah. No team goes through perfect things. Even look at Golden State, the adversity they went through the year they won 73 games. Like the playoffs <laughs> were just full of adverse situations for them. The regular season went incredibly smooth, but once they got to May and June, it was nothing but Steph adversity. Steph got hurt, right? Was that- Steph hurt his knee a little bit. Draymond got suspended. and I mean, Draymond racked up flagrant foul after flagrant foul. They were down 3-1 to OKC. Like, they went through a ton of adverse situations, and they were allegedly the greatest team to ever play in the regular season. It's just, it's it's part of the game, and it'll be, I think that the goal is to not have the extended losing streaks, to not mm-hmm. yes. to not let that stuff, like, You can't let in. it pile up. Right, and, I mean, because that's what happened on that last, last mm-hmm. West Coast road trip. They lost all five, and stuff piled up to a level where something had to change. And truthfully, that might have been the best thing. Yeah, right, right. The the team in hindsight, like losing those five games and now, especially because they've 
essentially dug themselves out of that hole. Mm. Losing those five games and getting the everything restructured probably helped them in the long run. Definitely, I would agree. So, Dane, let's get to your piece that you write every Monday. Uh, you write a piece for us every Monday at 1500 ESPN, and uh, you touched on some Tyus Jones things um, in uh, the piece you wrote yesterday, and it was pretty interesting because you got into some numbers um, with – how he performs with um, other starters on the floor and just sort of elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, well, it, I mean, the biggest, my biggest takeaway was just kind of going through, we don't have a huge sample of the the new guys here data yet, but now I think it's been, well, it's been 14 post-Jimmy Butler games. So I started going through, you know, some of the lineups and the best lineup now this season in terms of net rating is um, Tyus Jones is in that group and it's the bench plus Robert Covington and it's it's an interesting juxtaposition on the on last season's best lineup when it was Tyus Jones plus the starters. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying it's it's all Tyus Jones that is is the reason, uh, but it sounds like it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think when you when you tally up that in in back to back seasons, it it shows you you know it shows you some it's at least interesting mm-hmm. and and points to the notion of the value of a lower usage point guard who um, kind of embodies the, the type of style you, you want to play. And, and that group, particularly this season's group, um, is playing at a slower pace, they're def- and they're defending at a really high level, and they have a really high assist-to-turnover ratio. Those are quintessential Tyus Jones traits. And I don't know. I'm just, I'm just impressed by that again because last season I was pretty skeptical of that. Everyone kind of latched on to those numbers of – Okay, like the plus twenty four point three with Tyus Jones in with the starters, it, like he should be starting over Jeff T. It felt like he was an analytical darling. It was, it or it did, it did feel like it, and I was skeptical of that um, because if you kind of looked at those the eleven games he started for Jeff Teague, the Wolves were like hot at that point, like mm-hmm. entering that time they played a bunch of teams. Like if you go through game by game, is like. They played the Pacers, who didn't have Victor Oladipo. They played the Suns, who didn't have Devin Booker. It was just like, I kind of assumed it was statistically a statistical anomaly. There you go. And uh, and I think you know this is this is starting to suggest something else that he's just a really solid analytical darling. Yeah, and that's okay. I mean, he's, but, he's never going to be much more than what he is right now. I don't think. I don't think he's going to develop into someone that you can be a legitimate contender and have him as your starting point guard. But he's a great guy to have come off the bench. Maybe it can be, because I'm pretty much with you there, but maybe it can be even more impactful if the minutes are bigger, if, if that lineup is If he's more playing more, more than 13 minutes a night. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And I mean, I don't know. Right now you probably don't have a path to that. I mean, I know you could say maybe you want more ties over Teague. I would get that. But having Rose in there, and, yeah. and I believe you need to use Rose at the point guard a little bit, that isn't there, but... When we start th- talking about a year, two, three years down the road, if Tyus Jones is going to be, you know, part of this team, maybe this starts to suggest that you don't necessarily invest a ton of future resources in the point guard position and lean a little heavier onto Tyus. Well, I mean, the, he's not the only question mark they have at that spot yeah. for in the future because Jeff Teague has the nineteen million dollar player option this summer. Which... Well, what do you think? What do you think the the odds of him? I don't know if you were there at dinner when we were talking about that, but like some people are like, oh, he might not opt into that because it's like, where, I think where's he's his team going to? He's not going to get that kind of money anywhere else. Yeah, the, I mean that, that's that's my opinion too. I think the only thing I could see, the only reason I could see him opting out of that is if he feels like he could get more like long term security. Like if he feels like somebody's going to give him like, like a three year contract, like three years, thirty six, yeah, type deal. I could see that, but. I think more, like, traditionally what we see happening, and Thaddy Sung, actually, a former Wolf, kind of had the mm-hmm. had the same thing this year with the Pacers, and there was kind of some questioning of, like, oh, he might opt out. I think he had, like, $13 million, and, like, maybe he'll opt out to take, like, a three-year 30 or, or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I think what we, what we see is guys usually just grab that, yeah. that, dollar, that, that highest dollar value amount. Particularly at like Thad Young, once you're like up in thirty, up like Teague is. Yeah, I, I guess that's just to say my assumption is he does, you know, opt into that, and that's kind of a, a crucial pivot point when we talk about the future building blocks of, you know, of this team going forward. Yeah, the only guy I could think of that might have been like the exception was remember when AK forty seven was here? Yeah, and Khan I think it gave him two and twenty. 
Mm-hmm. And the second year, I think, was a player option, and he opted out of the ten million or whatever for the second year. Oh, that's a good for, one. Yeah, I didn't for whatever reason, and I well, never because he didn't believe in the team. I mean, they, yeah, they were that's the only probably thing, worse, reason I could think of. Worse than this group. Well, but then he signed with Brooklyn. Yeah, for like the, two million, I think. Yeah, but they had the Russian owner. That's true. Who there Mikhail was a Prokhorov. whole bunch of yeah. like speculation of like, well. <laughs> Might be getting that eight million back like somewhere else <laughs> on the side, but uh, but yeah, no, I, I don't know. It, it's and cr- yeah. it is worth noting with T. T. He's thirty. Like this could yeah. be his last chance to kind of cash in and yeah. sign a longer term deal because once you get above that age, and he'll if he does opt in, that means he won't be playing under a new contract until he's thirty two. So you have to wonder what he'll be able to get after an age thirty one year season. Right, and I think also that he just it, he's kind of a frustrating player. Oh, incredibly. How about the, the one possession, I want to say it was in the third quarter last night, he dribbled the ball for 23 seconds, passed it to Andrew Wiggins for a contested three. Yeah. I have never seen such a grenade in my entire basketball <laughs> watching life. Yeah, that was... Yeah, I mean, so... Have I, you seen a worse one? No, no, no. That it, that was that was bad, and it happens. It happens too often. Far I, I, too I wrote often. about that. Yeah. The, the call yeah. too is the the amount of um, late shot clock field goal attempts Andrew Wiggins is having, largely because of Teague, you know, in that sort of way. And at least entering last night's game, he was his effective field goal percentage with under four seconds on the shot clock was twenty six percent. Not great. Oof. Not not great. And that we've talked about this before, too, where Carl Anthony Towns last year led the league in effective field goal percentage late in the shot clock at 61%. So you want to get – you want to yeah. cat the ball in those situations, math would suggest. But what I will say to Teague's credit is – and if we're pointing to lineup data as any sort of, you know, reason or rationale is that the Wolf starters also had a very good net rating last season. And mm-hmm. Jeff Teague was a part of that. Yeah. And and same thing with this season. They're – they're, it's not their best lineup, but they're, they're second, and like I think it's their fourth best lineup. Also includes Jeff Deegs. So he's not like he's not necessarily this anvil. He's he's just frustrating and he's imperfect. He's he's Kirk Cousins. <laughs> that's what he. Oh, seriously, that's that's kind of what the it same is, right? Salary, right? What well, was Kirk? Is four four eighty four? Kirk got three and eighty four. Three and about twenty eight a one. year. Woo, okay, never mind. Getting nineteen. Deegs, but, my my NFL is. My NFL salary knowledge is not. You're not excused on point. for that. That's okay. <laughs> but it is kind of the same thing where yeah, right. Jeff Teague will. It, it's just like Kirk Cousins. Kirk Cousins will make some really good throws, and you're like, man, that was incredible. But then, like on the next possession, he'll do something that's like, oh my god, what is he doing? And it's kind of the same thing with Jeff Teague. Jeff Teague will play really well, but with him, it's more like games as opposed to like moments. It'll he'll he'll have games where you're like, man, Jeff Teague was really really good tonight. And then the next game, you're just like, oh, my God, he was See, awful. See, like Jeff Teague had that 18 assist night. Um, three points. <laughs> he had three points, 18 assists, yeah. and I didn't think he played well. <laughs> like, he had a career high in assists, and I'm just like, Jeff Teague wasn't that good tonight. It, it just wasn't. I think, and part of the reason I feel that way is so many of those possessions where he just drains the clock and then throws a grenade to somebody, and mm-hmm. sometimes and it turns shot. into an assist. I'm like, yeah. see, that's a waste of possession. If they don't score, it's an incredibly wasted possession. One, you got out of rhythm. You didn't get a good shot. That's Jeff the Teague, Rajon Rondo effect. Yeah, it, it's <laughs> that's when when I feel there are too many of those. No matter what his plus minus says, no matter how many assists he has, no matter how few turnovers he has, that's when I feel like he didn't play well at all. And I, so I don't know if this is a, a Kirk Cousins thing or not, but if the Vikings are to make the playoffs. I don't know if you can expect more out of Kirk Cousins than you've got or not. Like, if he's right. a player that does raise up to another level, mm-hmm. but Jeff Teague has shown he is that type of player where he tries harder in some games. I mean, mm-hmm. I I don't think that's outlandish to suggest at all. Like, you tick Jeff Teague off in the middle of a game, even a regular season game, you're going to get a good quarter out of him. Yeah. And in the playoffs, I, I thought he was, and he, I think he like sprained his finger or something too. But he was, I mean, he was a, a good player for the Wolves mm-hmm. in that playoff series last year because he brought another level to the game. So there is there is a higher plane when it comes to Jeff Teague compared to Tyus Jones. Is it more consistent? No, it's it's volatile. There's grenades along sure. the way. Sure, oh, tons of, tons of explosions. <laughs> but it is he's still the best point guard that that this team has. And mm-hmm. I mean, Derrick Rose has been good too. And a couple of games when he started at point guard, he's been good. But 
I still think you do need a lot out of Jeff Teague on this team, at, just as it's constructed, even if he's not worth, you know, $19 million this well, year. Well, he's certainly not worth it. Right. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't think that that's a – that is not up for debate in my opinion. I right. don't believe he's worth $19 million for a season. But if you're saying – if you're suggesting that he's, you know, that he's worth, you know, a 336 next year, like 12, like – I'm I wouldn't pay him that, but some team might. I'm not suggesting he's worth that. It's not to me. Like, right. if I were running a team, Jeff Teague would not be on my free agent big board. But someone might give him that money. Phoenix. So, so what would I mean? Okay, but there's I mean there's a there's a price you would pay him if you are you know Phoenix or a team who had a general need for a point guard. I mean, how much would you pay Jeff T? I don't think I'd go over eight or nine. Okay, so I, I'd probably say it's a little higher than that. But but still, like that does show that they're like we we get we get this way with contracts sometimes mm-hmm. Kirk Cousins or whoever yep. more so in the NBA where we go thank you you're for overpaid. listening to the purple podcast yeah. <laughs> you're, you're overpaid but that doesn't mean you're useless you're still you oh, still sure. have you yeah. still have a utility and i know that's not what you're suggesting but like i know uh, Gorgie Jang that's that's something like people tend to talk about or or a lot of those guys who signed big deals in the mm-hmm. summer of 2016 there's a almost that a entire disconnect. summer with yeah. the exception of Kevin Durant that entire summer they're, yeah, they're all they're all comparatively overpaid. That doesn't mean they're you know nothing. And and I I still think we're we're parsing through that. To, you know, Except for Timofey Moskov. <laughs> Timofey Moskov, Jan Mahin, me maybe. I don't know. There, there's a few of them. There's a few. Of them. Well, the other part of this too is, and we're totally speculating, but you you sort of that's why we're here, Manny. Recklessly speculate reckless speculation. Away, yes. Um, but you know, you you look at the off season, the the coming off season, and obviously we're still very early into this season. Um, but the market, the free agent market for point guards, is it going to be strong? Yeah. I don't, you know, I mean that that's a There's question. A the 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 draft is this a this upcoming draft is this a strong draft for point guards? I'm not sure that it is. It's strong not. There's not a lot Zion. of. There's not a there, lot well, of depth. The league at that is. Position. This is this is the most point guards. You know we've ever we've ever had in the league, right. and it, it's only becoming increasingly the the volume of point guards who come out of draft or lead ball handlers. Even if it's not a point guard, a guy you're going to run your offense through. There's more and more of those every year, and it it is decreasing the market value of the comparatively of of the point guard position. You know, at large, I think there's a strong argument to be made that that isn't a position you need to invest in, like John Wall style, or you know something right. like that, like. That can be a position where you can get a median level player and give yourself a financial benefit due to the just I mean it's supply and demand right like there's mm-hmm. just so many point guards now these days. And yeah. I, I do think something is to be said that this is probably the most that the game's ever been perimeter oriented to, especially with how much the three point shot matters and just everything is guards matter more now, I think than they ever have in the NBA. And that's not to say they haven't been vitally important at other times because they have, but the, it's just played so much more on the outside now. I, no, I, I, I definitely agree in the, in the point guards, you know, a big part of that. Yeah. And, and needs to learn how to adapt and, and you'll, you'll play a little bit differently now than maybe in 2009. And, and I think if if we're looking for fair criticisms on Jeff Teague, it's it's a lack of evolution in his game. From, I would agree from how he came in. I mean, even um, I mean the eye test kind of kind of gives you that. But if you just you look at him statistically, it's it's very much the same player. We haven't seen an increased volume in three point shooting. We haven't you know we haven't seen him you know playing at a faster pace. Kind mm-hmm. of these key tenets of change um, in the NBA. Jeff Teague has not embraced. Jeff Jeff Teague would be a perfect fit on a team in like two thousand seven. Yeah, he would I mean, be a yeah. great. He was, he was an all star. What, what year was that with the Hawks? Uh, 2015, 14, 15, 14, 14, 15 yeah. when they won sixty games. Yeah, not that long ago, they got but... swept in the conference finals that year. Yeah, I mean, but yeah, I don't know. I guess it's just you, you go through Twitter on these games and you, and you start seeing stuff, and you know, you, you, you see. You, you see but I, I also understand frustrations when yeah. things like that happen. Totally. If you're a fan, you're going to be frustrated. I mean, that it happens, and not just when it happens once, but it's. It's repeated. I just always suggest that when you know someone's going to be around for a long time, and again, if we're assuming he's opting in, it's you know it it makes it more fun to embrace the things, or at least be fair and acknowledging mm-hmm. the How things. He embrace does those do grenades. Well. The the things he does do well. I mean, and those, and there are things, of course, like it's to hold him accountable for. But but it seems like with Jeff Teague, we're we're just so eager to say. 
these are the you know the th- and I wrote I mean I wrote about, I'm 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 doing it too but I just I guess I'm just pushing back on the narrative that like all the minutes should be going to Tyus Jones and Derrick Rose or something right. like that. It, well, it shouldn't. It, 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 he's still solid. And the I, other the other part of it, too, is there was, with this fan base, there was such this deep-rooted love and yeah. connection with Ricky Rubio. <laughs> and Ricky leaves, and Jeff Teague is basically labeled, right. immediately right away, he's labeled as the guy who replaced Ricky Rubio. <laughs> we love Ricky, and, you know, how can, how can Tibbs trade Ricky away, even though we know right. now that Ricky kind of was the one who asked out. And everything, so I mean Jeff Teague. Ever since he got here, he's sort of Started had that off over on the his wrong head. Foot. Yeah, I remember at his media day, it was his first you know exposure to Minnesota last season. Somebody brought that up and was yeah. like, you know, Ricky's kind of been someone the Minnesota fan base is you know latched on to, and as the as the point guard and like you know, whatever. What are what are your thoughts about? That? And he goes, I hear about that. I hear about that every day. Yeah. I'm not kidding you. Every day somebody says something to me about Ricky Rubio. Yeah. And I was like, last year we from the beginning. Last year, every time Ricky had a good game for the Jazz, and every time Jeff Teague had a bad game for the Wolves, it was it blew up on Twitter. Right, Ricky and, had a good and, game the other night, and again, yeah. kind of understandably so too, because yeah. because again, the contract that paid him five million more a year and mm-hmm. an extra year than Rubio, and the fact that Jeff's older too, and yeah, so there 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 are there are fair criticisms of the player, and there's fair criticisms of the contract, and and to question, you know, the whole process of it. But again, he is the point guard mm-hmm. on this team. He should be the starting point guard on this team. Could it be flexed a little bit more to, you know, like last last night against the Warriors, Derrick Rose, in my opinion, should have never been playing the two when you're facing Clay Thompson Who is out there. Six seven, six eight. Yeah. Derrick mm-hmm. Rose is an undersized two as is. That's a a really difficult matchup for him. Holiday tips and fun facts from Paul, Kristen, and Dexter at Total Wine & More. There are 10,000 wine grape varietals worldwide. Here's to thousands and thousands of gift possibilities. Chardonnay paired with lobster mashed potatoes? Simply delicious. I know just the right $10 bottle for your white elephant party. The most stolen gift award is yours guaranteed. As you check off that gift list this holiday season, we'd love to share our always low prices and ridiculous selection at Total Wine & More. Cheers. Well, and that leads me to my next question, Josh Okogi. We got <laughs> three minutes last yeah. night. <laughs> well, we've been talking about he played. This, we've been talking about this ad nauseum for weeks now, though. That I mean, look, we we know in the grand scheme right now, it's it's difficult to just sort of fit him into the rotation. And sure, Gibbs has his nine man rotation, and he's set on that, and that's played what it is. But I have, for the last few weeks, long felt like situationally against certain teams and certain matchups, Tibbs has got to find a way to get Josh into the game just because of the, what he does defensively with the length. And, I mean, he plays hard and and everything. So it's just how – and well, this might just, this might just be yeah, – Last well, night that, was one of those games, That's what I'm Manny. saying. And, it, and, and I, I like what you're saying is it's a situational subbing. Yeah. Again, looking at the numbers of the success that Bench Unit has had, it's silly to say – this should have been done differently, like on, a, on an every night basis. I mean, it, yep. that is mm-hmm. very much working. It It's very much working. The thing is, is there are times and places, Golden State last night, when you yep. have massive wings in Clay Thompson, Kevin Durant, even Sean Livingston off the bench. They didn't have Iguodala last night, but they run big on the wing. You can't go with a 6-1 guy. And and that's something that Tibbs has been doing. He he had he had Derrick Rose guard LeBron when the Lakers. Oh. Were, I mean, it, you, there there are there are situations. Stick with the nine man. Stick with the way things are going the majority of the time. But when something is off and you have a different situation, you need to adjust to it. Somebody gets into foul trouble. Somebody or Robert Which Covington didn't play. Which is what happened last night. Yeah. Robert Covington I, I didn't was... play against Portland. That's an opportunity where you need to. You need to be more malleable and and you know and, and adjust that in a different way. Yes, Akogi played. But I think a Kogi could have started that game. Yes, uh, and then that's you leave, what I wanted you to leave bring Rose up. off the mat. I was really disappointed that Tibbs didn't make the decision to start a Kogi because I think moving Rose into the starting lineup it not only is yes, it led to 37 minutes from Derrick Rose, which is far too high in a non-overtime game in 2018. 
Wait, wait, which game? This was Portland. Portland. He played okay. 37 minutes, took 25 shots. Those are numbers that are too high for Derrick Rose in 2018. He also played 18 straight first half minutes. He does that the all the time. No, that's Tibbs does that with him all the time. Like that's not new. There, in when they were in Cleveland, when Andrew Wiggins did not close out the game, he played 17 straight minutes in the second half. Yeah. Like th- it, that is frustrating, but it's not a new thing. Like Tibbs does that that's with Tibbs. Derrick Rose all the time. And that's even Tibbs. injury aside. Like even obvi- which is a huge but thing with Derrick Rose. It's just Rose plays so hard. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like there's that redlining. Like you you hit that point where you're like, okay, where you now have the turbo where you're playing 2K and you have the turbo button on. For yeah. too long. The Gatorade <laughs> cups next to him. Yeah, I, like for five minutes he's got the Gatorade cup. He's begging to be subbed out. And and you know, what? but he, I mean, and what we've asked him about, it, he isn't like he said. What Rose has said is that's it's cool. Like he, I mean, that, he, that's fine. he has been nothing but the consummate yeah. professional. Yeah. He's been, I think, he's been great for this team. He's been great in that locker room. I think Derrick Rose has been awesome for the Wolves this year. But playing him 18 minutes at a time is is something you cannot do. Right. And sorry, I cut off your point a little bit with Portland. No, uh, I, was, I wish I was, that stuck out to me. I'm like, all right, Rose. No, you're, you're still spot in the game. on because yeah. that was something I was going to bring up. I wish they would have started Josh Kogi and just plugged him into Robert Covington's spot in the rotation and played him every single one of Covington's 30 minutes and just keep Derrick Rose as is because not only... And that's a normal only, thing to do. Like yes. for, for a lot of teams when they have, like, even... I remember, I don't know why this one always sticks out to me. Like, when Denver was really good and uh, that, that one season and Melo got hurt for a while, mm-hmm. uh, they, they took Julius Hodge, who was completely out of their rotation, and just plugged him into, into the, the starting lineup, and, and it just didn't... It didn't shift anything in the way that everyone else played. Like obviously, it's not mellow out there, but the team didn't lose a beat because it was still so much. Of the you same. want the ripple effect to be minimal. Yeah. You, if someone's going to be have to miss a game like Covington did the other night, and that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Covington's not going to be the last player in this roster to have to be inactive for a game. I promise you, someone is going to get hurt at some point this season, whether it's for one game or for ten. Right. Someone's going to miss time. It just happens. Mm-hmm. You need to be able to plug in Josh Akogi into his spot, give Covington or give Akogi all of Covington's minutes, because that doesn't change anything else. Then your bench unit stays the same. You sub one player in for Covington, but the other four guys are the same. Yep. You don't change not only the starting lineup but also the bench lineup. You don't overload Derrick Rose, who should not be playing 37 minutes at this age after everything his body's been through. He's just not that guy, sure. and you can't play him 18 minutes straight either. Like they do, I, I would just like him to you know consider who what who's the opponent what like what yeah. is the situation at large. I don't here? think the like, opponent matters in playing him eighteen minutes. I think that's a no no if it's against me, you, Manny, Seth, and Jonathan. I guess I'm, I'm <laughs> saying the in the like in the context of the Portland game, like it you know it it, it was, and against the Warriors, against bigger wings. I guess I just I don't have problem with the rigidity of the rotation because in in ways you know it's working. But once something stops working and is a little bit off the tracks, mm-hmm. you need to adjust yeah. and say, all right, how do we optimize this on the fly? You can't, I mean, again, we've said this before, it isn't just a video game where you say, you play these nine minutes followed by this person playing this eight minutes and that. Yeah. Like, It's not you, 2K. You don't, you, and you don't see that around the league. you got to be you, flexible. You see guys shuffling in and out of the lineup, like maybe even three times in a quarter. Like That happens around the league. Turn on another game and that happens. It it doesn't happen in Minnesota, and so I don't know. I, I think it's something fair to hold Thibodeau accountable, accountable for, but also to recognize that, you know, in some ways we were wrong by saying, "What the heck? Why is this only a nine-man rotation? You've totally taken a Kogi out." Like part of the reason this team has been good oh, post Covington trade sure. is because of the rotation in that way. But again, it's doing the situational subbing thing that Thibodeau said he was going to do, and has not, largely has not, with a Kogi. Or with Anthony Tolliver. So last night I watched the Warriors broadcast because I typically do watch the... When when the Wolves are on the road and I'm not there, I typically get the home team feed. Mm-hmm. And they were stunned Anthony Tolliver didn't play. Stunned. Oh. You know, I'm stunned that if you're broadcasting... A, you don't realize that he's not in the rotation. You why do you not watch the team's last game? That's like my biggest pet peeve of like, all right, your, your, your job here today is to do play-by-play or color commentary of a game, you should know what the other team did, at least in their last game. Watch the last game they played. I, I, I heard that too, and I was just like... Or look at a box score from the last <laughs> month. month. Yeah, right. I mean, I'm not saying they're wrong. Like, 
Anthony Tolliver. Sure, particular. but like they were they were stunned he did not get off the bench. <laughs> they probably want That's... him on the the Golden State Warriors. He he'd could be, be, a pretty, be pretty there, awesome yeah. instead of like Jarebko. Jarebko Jarebko's been good though too. Yeah, that's true. I mean, At could help a lot of teams. Yeah, he could help a lot of teams. I think he. I think he will help somebody else. Yeah. I, I just don't know if Thibodeau will, will pull the trigger for like a second round pick. I just don't know if he'll do that. It depends what they get, but I mean, I think if there's a name that's going to get moved off this roster, it's him. I think, like, not fan logic because that's like pejorative, but like normal logic, non Thibodeau logic would suggest that. But I think Tibbs is like, what? Like, I'm not doing anything that could potentially subtract from the total sum of wins my team can get this season. And he, like you were just saying, knows there's going to be a point in time in the season where someone's going to miss 10 games. Yeah. And he wants to be able to plug Anthony Tolliver in, not a 2020 second round pick. You know, like the, that's there, fair. there is, I just think that's, my guess would be that's what Thibodeau's mentality is. So I, I'm not really, I think maybe a, a trade makes sense, but I, I just certainly don't think, think it's it going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> certainly think a trade makes yeah. sense. Going back to a Kogi very quickly, and I know we got to go here in a second, but can we get past, a, and I don't mean, when I say we, I don't mean the three of us, but I'm more so asking Tom Thibodeau this question. Can we get past the fact that Josh Kogi is a rookie? And just well, he's got to earn his minutes, and he's got. I mean, he's. I love your Tibeto voice. <laughs> he's got to play hard for forty-eight minutes. Um, <laughs> but I mean, we, we we have to get past the fact that he's a rookie and he's got to earn his minutes and everything. He's when you put him on the floor, good things happen. More you, good things right. happen than bad things happen. So it's it's like I I I wish that Tibbs was sort of get get away from and I understand you know he's a young player and you want to kind of keep him grounded and everything but he does good things when he's on the floor is maybe the spot to have him on the floor in that first quarter when Covington subs out instead of plugging in Derrick Rose and playing him 18 minutes straight is that maybe the spot to and then maybe give put a Kogi, Rose in with maybe like two maybe minutes give left in the first quarter yeah maybe give a Kogi four minutes in the first quarter and the third quarter I, I know it's not a ton, but if you're going to find time for him, I think that might be the spot. So that expands it to 10. Mm -hmm. And even if that, what you're suggesting, 12, 15 minutes a game for him. I like don't that. even know if it's it's like 8 to 10 minutes a game. Okay, well, pinning that, because I think that's interesting too, is if even if it's 8 to 10, you end up subtracting that 8 to 10 from the other bench guy. I mean, it mm -hmm. it, it it would it's it would, coming out of a little bit out of Derrick Rose. It, yeah, sure, and and maybe most mostly out of Derrick Rose. So okay, I I get that. That's that makes some sense to me. However, what if because he's a rookie, he wouldn't be as good in those four minute stints? What we have seen him have success in the games that all the games you're talking about, and that he has looked to be largely productive every time. But the games he's played, he's had a huge role. He's been able, even the Portland game, he played 26 minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I, I, my, my fear with kind of just plugging a Kogi in into something like that is that four, four minutes here and there wouldn't give him enough time to like get, get his going. feet under him to, yeah, to kind of be that. Cause I swear, and this is just like memory eye test, whatever. I swear every one of like Josh Kogi's like very first plays or like drives is like something crazy where it like barely catches the rim and then he goes and makes up for it with like a defense play down on the other end. But like mm -hmm. he does kind of take a little bit of time to get going. I think at least that's see, I, I think if you would put him out with that lineup, which could potentially be, it would be cat Sharich, Wiggins, Teague and him. You don't need him to necessarily be that offensive threat. You need him to be someone that's going to bring energy and play good defense. And you can do that in four minutes. You don't need to, get your feet wet into the game to do that. You can jump right in and do those things. And and you know what? Like maybe we do see something like that. I mean we won't. We won't. We know we won't. I mean it's gonna it's gonna be a nine man rotation. Tibbs isn't gonna change. I'm just spitballing here something that's not going to happen. And I wonder too on the Derrick Rose front if long term speaking in terms of over the rest of the season, if giving him three or four fewer minutes a game is going to help him stay sort of healthy and fresh over the course because it adds up Danny, sorry i'm knocking your head or you're knocking your microphone there but you talked about it earlier about like Derek's body has been through a lot over the years I like mean, you, like you last just, night he played 34 minutes if you get that that down to 28 minutes 
you feel a little bit better about it. Yeah, and yes, I and I and I know you would agree with it. it's. It's just easier said than done. Oh, I know, sure. and yeah. I, I know when this isn't going to happen. Like yeah. that's another thing. Tibbs is not going to adjust to do this. It's just not going to be the case. But it's a thought and an idea, though, right? Like it's mm-hmm. just, it's just like I wonder. I guess my question is, I wonder if Tibbs thinks about that. I think he does. You know, I think Tibbs thinks about anything that can th- lead to more winning. And if we are right that this is something that can drive more winning. I do think Tibbs I, – I, I mean, he is close-minded in a lot of ways, but mm. if he does reach a point in time where it exceeds that threshold where he's like, yeah, I do think that Josh now has enough experience, time and practice, yada, 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 that we could see it. I mean, yes, more likely than not – it's like our Kevin Durant conversation last week. It's like – It's not going to be on the Warriors next year. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, and one thing I want to say, just because I know, like, whether it's, you know, text with friends or whoever, I'm talking to people around around the Wolves, it's, you know, this this is such a, a big conversation. I understand it's, like, a meaningful one. But one thing that I don't think we, we talk about enough and we, we focus on this, these minutiae type things is Carl Anthony Towns. It's just so much more important than yeah. anything else. Yeah. And he's playing so well. He has playing this, this a lot better trade. since and the trade, yeah. It's just, and that's huge. Like that is, you know, that is the team. Yeah. So in all I said these, it all summer. Yeah. I said it all summer that he was, when the rumblings of the Butler stuff, even before his trade request came out, I, I told the Phil and Judd on the air, I said, Carl Anthony Towns is the most important piece for the future of this franchise. And every you have decision, to get him right more than anything else. Yes. Every decision, whether it's in-game or long-term roster construction, the first, second, and third thing you need to consider is how does that affect Carl Anthony Towns and how does it weaponize and maximize what it is you can get out of him. So, yeah, I mean, the, the bigger conversation, if we want to talk about any of the minutia things, whether it's Dario Saric, Josh Okoge, whatever, the question is how does Josh Okoge impact Carl Anthony Towns? How does Dario Saric versus Taj Gibson affect Carl Anthony Towns? Those are the things you need to look at because he's all that matters. The team's going to... Steam is like best case going to be a seventh or eighth seed in the league, which means they're probably going to go and they're going to play the, you know, they're going to play the Warriors in the playoffs, and it's going to be a similar sort of thing to last season. What is important is not that, or what's more important than that is what are they going to do in 2020, 2021, mm-hmm. when Towns is 25 years old and and is able to actually, the, the question becomes more realistic of how does a Carl Anthony Towns led team compete against the Warriors then, mm-hmm. or the equivalent of the Warriors in 2021. Who yeah. won't be the same when Kevin Durant's gone? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or just older. Or I mean, or anyone on the, any of that. Like those teams are older. I mean, it's it's just about cat and like that's why I just I never am like too frustrated with any loss or really anything with this because sure. provided that Towns is still playing this way, which is good, that we're cool. Like we're moving in the right direction because because Towns is finally being embraced as the guy. And the reality is when, you know, three years from now, when Carl Anthony Towns is 25, 26 years old, this roster is going to look different. I yeah. mean, it, there's going to be probably some significant differences to this roster as opposed to what it is right now. I mean, there's probably five or six guys that are on this roster right now that aren't going to be here right. three years from now. Which makes the minutiae along the way important. Sure. We do need to, like, not we, but, like, Thibodeau does need to parse through how important is Jeff Teague. How important is Tyus Jones? What ways can we use Josh Okoge? Yeah. Like the minutiae along the way is going to determine in how you work with Carl Anthony Towns in 2021. So it's it's like short term and it's long term, but but both of those need to be considered. And I just try, just trying to shine some light on like sure. we're in a pretty good spot with Cat right now. Yeah, I agree. Um, all right, I think that's going to be it for us. That was uh, that was a lot of fun. Great talk. Uh, follow uh, follow Dane on Twitter at Dane Moore NBA. Follow uh, Danny on Twitter at Real D Cunningham. Follow me at Manny Hill Eight Four, as you can probably see on your screen if you're watching the stream. Um, you can download this podcast if you missed any portion of it. Uh, you can find it on 1500ESPN.com, on iTunes, PodcastOne.com, and anywhere else you find podcasts. For Dane, Danny, I'm Manny. Thanks for watching and listening, and uh, we'll talk to you next time on Raised by Wolves. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to the show. TCL launched a new lineup of award-winning 4K Roku TVs to deliver the best sports, movies, TV shows, and thousands of streaming channels. TCL's personalized home screen makes it easy to customize your TCL to fit the way you watch. Binge watch what you want, when you want. 
TCL delivers excellent picture quality, sleek design, and stunning resolution at an affordable price. TCL, America's fastest-growing TV brand, is available at major retailers everywhere. Learn more at TCLUSA.com. I'm Rita Foley with an AP News Minute. President Trump points to a violent attack in France as he calls on Democrats to give him $5 billion to build a border wall. The president says he'll take the heat for shutting down the government if he doesn't get that money. If we close down the country, I will take it because we're closing it down for border security. And I think I win that every single time. The squabble in the Oval Office yesterday between the president and Democrats Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi got loud. This is Schumer. We have a proposal that Democrats and Republicans will support to do a CR that will not shut down the government. We urge you to take it. And if it's not good border security, I it won't take it. It is very good border And if it's security. not good border security, border security, I won't take it. The president tweets this morning, we need the wall to strengthen the border and calls attention to the incident in France yesterday in which a gunman shot 16 people in Strasbourg, killing three of them. He is still on the run. Authorities looking for him this morning. I'm Rita Foley.